Amen. We want to build our lives upon Christ, not on any other foundation. We know that that will just be sand that is bound to shake and be destroyed and fall when the storms come. So we build upon Christ, our, our rock. Well, we come to part two of our four-part series here on biblical eldership. And so last time, we, we began with just setting the foundation, wanting to ease into it all together. Wanting to say, hey, we're, we're all in this. We're all seeing this. This isn't coming from an opinion of man. Uh, this isn't something that's you know, unique to the weirdness of Mission Community Church. But we're saying, no, this is the scripture speaking. When we look at the scripture, we, we see that God says something when it comes to leadership of his people. God says something when it comes to leadership of the local church. And so we were able to set that foundation, that the case for biblical eldership, that it is God's design, it's his desire, it's even his command, that, that we have a plurality of men that are qualified leading local churches. That was the pattern of the New Testament. That was what we saw unfold in the New Testament. And now we get to take another step in this series of biblical eldership. So it is true, the foundation, what we see from Scripture, is there needs to be a group of men that are leading. These are elders, these are overseers, these are pastors, shepherds that are leading the local church in each local church. But we can say more. Because who do you select? Well, what group of men? The ones with all the money? The ones with all the power and influence? But the ones that have, have the, the most gifted abilities, who do you select? Who, are, who is this group of men? How do you start to narrow it down? What are we looking for? Well, thankfully, God is very clear about this as well. In two very, very crystal clear passages in the New Testament, we learn about the character of elders. This group of men must be qualified men. And how do we know what a qualified man looks like? We look to the scriptures. We look to the word of God and we're going to find that what God desires most of this group of men, of these people that are leading his churches, that they must be men of character. They must be men of character. It is so true over and over throughout redemptive history in the scriptures. What you see play out over and over again is that man looks at the outward appearance. Man at, looks at, at, at people and they only see on the superficial level and they say, that's a leader. Look at this guy. He gets the job done. Look at the results. But God, over and over again, looks at the heart. It's no surprise when we look back at the anointing of David as king. That's what God made very clear. He looks at the heart and it's still that way. He still desires to see men of character that are truly committed to him at that deepest level, the heart. That's who must be leading the church. And so we're going to wade into this topic, the character of elders, and see it from the New Testament again. We're going to be looking back and forth at two passages, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus 1, 5 through 9. I may give a little preference to Titus 1, but we're going to be looking at both, and at times I'll have it up on the, the screen for you anyways. But to start our time, I'm just going to read from Titus 1. Titus 1, verses 5 through 9. You'll recognize verse 5. We set it up last time as an important element in defending the case for biblical eldership. But now we read on and we see more about the character of elders that must be qualified to lead. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Paul writes to Titus, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So we're going to slow down on this, take a deep dive into the character of elders that will lead the church as God has designed it. So let's look and begin with the most basic and fundamental point here, the abbreviated character of an elder. If you were to summarize it, if you were to just put it into a couple words or one phrase, what is God looking for? 
I've already said a man of character. God is looking for men of character. That's my term, but there's a biblical term that just shouts it. It's mentioned three times so clearly. You see it in 1 Timothy 3. You see it twice in the passage I just read in Titus 1. What are we looking for? Well, what if, if you just had to boil it down to one simple thing? The character of an elder. An elder must be a man who is above reproach. Above reproach. Or blameless. Above reproach. It essentially means that an individual is unable to be called out or accused. To be above reproach is that abbreviated version of the character required for church leaders. One commentator writes, this is the general, overarching, and all-embracing qualification. Another writer says, to be above reproach means to be free from any offensive or disgraceful blight of character or conduct, particularly as described in the rest of the verses of the qualifications of an elder. Of course, just because someone is accused or called out doesn't mean that all of a sudden they are disqualified. Jesus said clearly in Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when others revile you. And persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Oh, accusations can and will come for the Christian. And hopefully they're false accusations or accusations against the very character of our Lord. Any accusation, though, that can come against an elder or a man that is supposedly or being put up for an elder, any accusation must be confirmed with real evidence. It must not be false. As scripture clearly tells us in 1 Timothy 5, verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. There must be a, a proper way to say there's a legitimate ac accusation and it's not falsely being trumpeted by one person. This word, though, above reproach is addressing disqualification for any legitimate blight or immaturity that would surely cause distraction and confusion in the church's pursuit of Christ-like maturity. Another commentator writes, this word does not refer to sinless perfection, but to a personal life that is beyond legitimate accusation and public scandal. Another writer says it this way, Paul did not affirm sinless perfection and even Christ was reproached. Paul means the person should be of stellar character and free of obvious and provable black marks against his character. So that's the simple, most abbreviated form of what we're looking for in terms of the character of elders. They must be above reproach. The elders of any church should be quick to admit that they're not perfect. However, church leaders should not take lightly this responsibility to live upright and blameless lives. And so this is a, an important time for us in the life of our church to pray for this. Pray for God to recognize this among us. Pray for God to set this apart among us. Pray for God to, to raise up these leaders, that we wouldn't have leaders that relax the standards required for elders, but instead that we would have elders that are practicing Christ-likeness. That's one of our ministry priorities as a church. We're committed to persistent prayer, the proclamation of the word, and, and we hopefully are very much committed to pursuing people and practicing Christ-likeness or holiness. Where should you see that? You should see that in the leadership of the church. Also, what I enjoy about this topic is this is not a topic that you should just let sit and say, this is only for the leaders. I don't need to think about this because that's a temptation this morning. That's a temptation for our next few studies is to keep saying, oh, good. This is just for the leaders. I don't need to worry about this. I don't have to be above reproach. Is that a mature perspective for you to take this morning? I, I don't need to worry about my character. I don't need to worry about my heart. This is just for other people. Absolutely not. You know the calling upon your life as well. You know what you signed up for when you said you were going to follow Christ. You signed up for a life of saying no to sin in the old ways and putting on the new ways of Christ-likeness. You too are striving for this character. All of us. And since you're striving for maturity in your faith, reflect on whether or not this is true of you. That you are, in fact, above reproach. Are you, yourself, modeling well for others what it means to live the holy life that God's called us in? Are you set apart unto God as he would have you be? This is the, the simple place to go. If you want to introduce and get into the subject in the most simple form, you're looking for above reproach, blameless men to lead the church. But we can say more. And of course, that's what Paul does in our passages. So point two, we come to see the affirmed character of an elder. How will you know when someone is above reproach? How will you know that someone is blameless? Well, we get some help. We get some help as we work through these passages some more. 
the affirmed character of an elder. What Paul will say to Timothy and Titus is that you will see that this man is in fact a man who is above reproach in three very clear areas in their life. In their marriage, in their parenting, and in the world. You'll see it. It'll be clear. They'll pass all three tests. They're not going to be good in one area and deficient in the other two. You'll see it in all three realms. A man of character, above reproach, will be noted in his marriage, parenting, and in the world. This is where it'll be affirmed. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, he says it this way. You're looking for a man who is the husband of one wife. The same phrase comes up in Titus 1, verse 6. The husband of one wife. So let's consider that first. A man who is above reproach in his marriage. This is not necessarily requiring marriage. Some people might take that view, that if you're going to be an elder of a church, you have to be married. I don't think that's Paul's point. I think that'd be an interesting thing for Paul to say since he wasn't married. It's kind of awkward. But I don't think that's his point at all. I think he's talking about the actual character of the person right now, not their status, not their status necessarily. Paul wasn't married. Same with Jesus. So he's probably not addressing even second marriage after death or divorce. That would have more to do with digging up one's history and looking back in the past. I don't think that's what he's really trying to do. I think what he's after is one's blameless lifestyle currently. This is who the man is now. This is who the man is now in his marriage, assuming he's married. The exact Greek phrase, as we've mentioned before, translates as one woman man. He's a one woman man. There is one woman in his life, and that is clear, and that is evident. And it captures the focus upon a man's faithful and loving commitment to his wife. And of course, this, this needs to be true both externally and internally. There is an external fidelity and an internal fidelity to his wife. He's externally loving his wife, and you see it modeled in the way that he's called to even as Christ loved the church. In Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Certainly, this prohibits any type of affair that a man might have with another woman besides his wife. Whether that's a, a physical affair that's happening or even some type of emotional affair or extra special treatment or flirtation that goes above and beyond. He's crossed the line. He's no longer above reproach. When you look at a man who is above reproach, you look at his relationships and his life and you say, there's one woman for that man. Not a host of women and whoever gives him attention. There's one woman for that man. That's it. His wife. And it's clear externally. There's no question about it. But like I said, internally it ought to be clear as well because God cares about the heart. There's this internal fidelity to the wife. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, you heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This speaks to the importance of the heart, as Jesus said. Blameless men will be fighting lustful internal impulses. Blameless men will be vigorously renewing their love and desire to serve and lead one woman alone. One woman alone. And this qualification is very important. It's important on two levels. First, given the low standard of the culture, the church is very tempted to follow. The, the, the culture does not set a high bar in this area. Uh, you know, an upstanding person, you know, who really cares about their love life? It's their love life. None of my business. Let them do whatever they want. Does he get the job done? Does he, does he get the results? Does he bring in the money? Then that's all that matters. That's how the world thinks. That's the low standard of the culture. And so numerous churches quickly overlook this and they restore a pastor who's committed adultery and say, it's all good. It's not a big deal. We get it. We all mess up. And this way of functioning completely undermines the church's claim to be holy as God is holy. Instead, the church just looks like the world who approves of things like adultery and affairs and flings and things of that nature. But the second important matter for this is what kind of love and sacrifice and commitment can a church expect from a pastor who's okay with adultery? What kind of commitment even is that? The guy doesn't even have a right view of love. And if he can't be loyal to his physical bride, how is he going to be loyal to the spiritual bride of Christ, the church? The church's zeal to uphold an expectation of loyal love in their pastor's marriage naturally overflows into genuine pastoral and loyal love of the pastor for that church. One commentator wrote it this way. Paul probably has in mind a candidate showing signs of loving his wife like Christ loved the church. Pastoral leadership calls for integrity and fidelity to the marriage covenant. 
The, rob the robust love for God and people that is in the lifeblood of pastoral care should be fueled by the discipline and joy of married love in the pastor's personal life. It just doesn't carry over. The second the pastor gets an excuse on that, why would you expect him to have that kind of loyal love for the flock? So considering this quality of being above reproach and mature, how are you doing? God's people are called to be mature and holy, and are you committed to this singular and loyal love for your spouse? Above reproach, externally and internally. Are there external temptations you need to address immediately? Intimate friends that you've allowed into your life to surpass your spouse? Coworkers? Maybe TV and movie choices? Maybe social media temptations? Uh, whatever they are, they're, they're everywhere. There's plenty of them, but perhaps they're in your life and they need to be cut off now. I, I mean that word immediately because that's how scripture would say it. Put it to death. Flee from that sexual morality. Run from it. Maybe there's internal desires that you're not putting to death. You're just letting them fester. You're just letting them linger in your mind. Ask God to unite your heart in fear and devotion unto him. So you're not split unto these several different devotions. This will truly lead to a desire to love your spouse from the heart. Are you single, but maybe you're carelessly spreading your love and affection to many? Even though you aren't married, such conduct cannot be reconciled with the call to maturity and commitment to one person, even if God hasn't revealed that person yet. Another area, the second area here that character is affirmed for an elder that's above approaches in parenting. In parenting, 1 Timothy 3 says it this way, verses 4 and 5. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And Titus 1.6. And his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So let's begin with looking at Titus' words on this. What, what Paul says to Titus as we find it. Paul's telling both of them, Timothy and Titus, to identify men who are proven stewards and the managers of their children in their household. Blameless men will have a reasonable control and management over their children. And you see this in a couple ways with how Paul says it to Titus. First, blameless men will have children that are faithful. Faithful. And so I just want to draw attention to this for a moment because it is a tad confusing. English texts that we have have translated this phrase to mean something differently. I have the ESV. It says, and his children are believers. The NASB says, having children who believe. And likewise, the NIV says, a man whose children believe. So that, that sounds like something. That sounds like blameless men will have children who are in fact believers, saved and born again. That's what it can come across as. Who's not a believer would then not be qualified to be an elder is what this sounds like. But is that the best understanding of this phrase? The adjective Greek word pista, modifying the man's children, must be translated and can be translated differently. It's the Greek word that for belief or faith or trust or even rely and submit and even obey. The New King James, for instance, says having faithful children. Just like the Christian Standard Bible and the Net Bible both say this as well. Faithful children, not children that are believers. And this Greek word has that sense of faithful, not necessarily believing, but faithful in other passages of Scripture. In Matthew 24, 45, when Jesus is telling parables, he says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master set over his household? Or 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Paul says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And so these usages surely don't mean believers, but simply obedient, submissive, reliable, faithful servants and stewards. That's what this word could mean. And so it's best to understand the blameless man's children, not necessarily as believers, but as faithful, reliable, trustworthy, obedient, and submissive children. That's what this is about. We notice more, though, looking at the text in Titus. Blameless men will not have children that are wildly insubordinate that are wildly insubordinate. Paul uses two terms to describe the inappropriate behavior for the children of the blameless men. First, he says that their children must not be open to the charge of debauchery. To the charge of debauchery. Okay, what does that mean? When you take a step back and look at how it's used elsewhere in the New Testament, you realize it's pretty serious. It's pretty, pretty bad living. Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Those that get drunk with wine 
definitely lead to some terrible actions. 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4, the word is found there as well in this list. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery. So a blameless man must have children who are not given to this wild living like the prodigal son. Surely the church and society would see such behavior from his children and conclude the man has no control or any influence over his children. It's wild. It's debauchery. The other term that Paul uses is that one's children must not be open to the charge of insubordination. Insubordination. Again, we find it's a strong word that's used in a strong list in 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Paul says, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient or insubordinate, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. The commentator writes, what must not characterize the children of an elder is immorality and undisciplined rebelliousness. If the children are still at home and under his authority. Paul's not asking any more of the elder and his children than is expected of every Christian father and his children. However, only if a man exercises such proper control over his children, may he be an elder. So a man with faithful children will be a man with proper control over his children so they don't run off into lifestyles of debauchery and insubordination. Now let's consider Paul's words to Timothy on the matter. There's two more considerations we can add real quick. First is, the home is the proving ground of a man's leadership. The home is the proving ground is what he's clearly saying. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5 again. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Paul intentionally makes a connection between one leadership in the home and one's ability or lack thereof to lead the church. Notice the clear parallel that Paul makes in verse 5. If someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So in discovering a potential elder's ability to care for God's church, the management of the home must be considered. There's a second thing to notice in 1 Timothy 3. Blameless men are specifically measured by their stewardship and management over their children. Not necessarily the, the results or what we're looking at, but the stewardship and management over their own children. The text clarifies the goal of the qualification for elders. Elders must be able to manage their own children well, regardless of whether or not the children are saved. Ultimately, the salvation of any human is entirely dependent upon the gracious gift of God, not the perfection of the home. But notice some details here about this management that Paul commends to Timothy. We realize the parallel to Paul's words to Titus when Paul tells Timothy that an elder must be keeping his children submissive. Very much parallel. But Paul gives Timothy a little more detail of what this management should look like. First, he states that an elder must manage his own household well with all dignity. With all dignity. And so this phrase removes some of the extreme cases that we might be picturing in our heads. An elder who does not manage his household well because he yells at his wife and kids. Or an elder does not manage his household well because his, his family fears him. Or an elder exercises leadership in the home and he must do it instead of those things with dignity. Second, Paul draws a parallel between an elder's management of the home and his care for the church. And notice this, this parallel between management and care. The management in the home ought to give some insight into the care this man is able to express as a church leader. That's an interesting parallel. Management and care. That's to say, all the things that an elder might call the church to do through humble, gentle, peaceful, patient, spirit-filled leadership should be exemplified in the leadership that he has in the home as well. Commentator writes it this way. The picture of an aspiring overseer Paul paints then is not of an exasperated authoritarian husband roaring at his children, slapping them into subjection, or enforcing strict compliance when church people are present to keep up appearances. You can see the temptation there, though. Instead, commentator goes on to say, this qualification is not about a husband cracking the whip at home so he can bring the same people taming talent to a congregation. 
It is rather about the love of the Father through the gospel for his people, finding full and authentic expression in the real daily private life of a father and husband as requisite before he is considered for appointment to shepherding God's flock. I like what he says. He goes on to say, key congregational essentials are exercised first in the marriages and homes of church members, or it is sheer hypocrisy to pretend they exist on Sundays. Things like forgiveness, care for others, prayer in regard for God's word, self-sacrifice, loving service, respect for others, listening to others, finding joy in what pleases others rather than oneself, making personal changes and forsaking sin for the sake of improved relations with other family members, in many cases, seemingly endless delayed gratification, and much more. Paul writes to Timothy to cultivate congregations of real-life authenticity, not showcases for religious pretending. The task requires big men, not little autocrats. Big men who actually have the love of the Father exemplified 24-7. You don't see them in the home. Yeah, they're managing their home, but it is. They're cracking the whip, and it is just authoritarian. But then in church, it's all peace and love and gentle. But this should pervade, really, should be all of their life. And qualification is important. For the sake of the testimony of the church, of course. If an elder's child is engaged in wild living and insubordination, then the testimony of the church is maligned. But also, think of the health of the church. Why would a church want an elder to be responsible for leading them if they can't even manage their own household? Finally, there's a third area that we mentioned. This is before the world. And this is only mentioned in 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. He must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. So much like the home, it's easy for areas of one's life to be sectioned off from another. The man that we all know here at church may not be the same man that people know at his job. That happens. Paul adds that even the world should affirm this man's character on some level. Now, this might seem tricky, though, if you think about it. Doesn't the world hate us as Christians? Isn't the world, like, against us and what we believe and what we stand for in the Word of God? Couldn't you argue that the, the more the world despises someone, the better? That's a more faithful Christian. You want a guy that the world just hates. They are just sick of him. That's a good Christian. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Paul's point is not to say that elders must be perfect or that they must be in perfectly good standing with unbelievers. The Bible is clear elsewhere that this will be impossible at times. After all, what what does light have in common with darkness? Very clear. But Paul's concerned about the public testimony of the church. What could certainly sink the testimony of any church is the hypocrisy of the leadership. If a man is above reproach at church, but just like the world at his job, then even unbelievers will see right through that. It won't be hard for them. The church's reputation is at stake. One commentator says, Paul's usage is a reminder that the church has a public reputation to uphold, as well as its own in-house needs and standards. God's word demands that a man's character is to be affirmed in the household and in the world. We all desire for God's church to be free from disgrace and scandal. Not only will our own hearts be hurt by such scandal, our own Christian testimony will be dismantled. So we need to pray. Pray that God protects us from snares that would bring disgrace upon the church, especially in our leadership. We come to point three then and move on to from the affirmed character to the avoided character of an elder. The avoided character of an elder. Again, we continue to unfold what it means to be above reproach, and Paul gives this in 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Titus 1 verse 7, similarly, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. So these passages are, are very parallel. And let's start with what Paul says in Titus 1, verse 7, working through that. He must not be arrogant. Literally, the the word is self-willed, stubborn, self-pleasing. That is not who we need. Those people can look like great leaders, but they are arrogant people. They lack humility to work with others. As Peter will say in 1 Peter 5, 3, you're looking for elders that are not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Not the self-willed, domineering type but the Christ-like type who existed to be a servant and a slave of all. 
A commentator writes, pastors need to be proactive and bold in witness and service. But such forthrightness cannot cross over the line to self-importance and a sense of superiority or entitlement over others. <clears throat> it's tempting for all leadership positions to become that, though. We move on, he says, or quick-tempered. Neither can they be quick-tempered. It's an interesting word, only appears here in the New Testament, but it does seem to run parallel to the idea of quarrelsome, fighting, as he says in 1 Timothy 3.3. Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, It's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. Those are the foolish people, the ones that are fighting and quick-tempered and quarreling with others. It's a type of character that displays a lack of self-control, and it only brings more sin, as the proverb says. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one gives, given to anger only causes much transgression. Paul says similarly in 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 25, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. That's not what you are to be about, Timothy. That's not what elders and pastors are to be about. Is there a time to defend the faith? Absolutely. There's a time to stand on the truth and to represent the truth and to do so accurately. But you are not to be one looking for fights. I want more quarrels. I want more action. I want more fights. That's not the way of an elder. Also, he must not be a drunkard. Literally alongside of wine. Alongside of wine. Like Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, he mentioned, do not get drunk with wine. Not necessarily condemning all drinking of alcohol, but recognizing that being given to it and becoming drunk from it is not acceptable. Nor violent. As 1 Timothy 3.3 also says, not violent, but gentle. Exerting dominance or bullying, it comes from the verb to strike. You can't be a striker, one that lashes out and violently, physically hits, even. It's potentially connected even to the drunkard that was mentioned before. But as we know, the way of an elder that is above reproach should be clear, because it's a way of peace, not violence and quarreling. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And James 3, verse 18, A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's what you're looking for in a qualified elder. What else? He must avoid being greedy for gain. Greedy for gain. It's the same word that's mentioned in the deacon qualifications, as well as the elders in 1 Timothy 3, 3, not a lover of money. God affirms the concept of pastors being paid, of course. We see that in 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Timothy 5. But scripture is very clear on this topic. An elder ought not to be in it for shameful gain, as Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 2. An elder must be doing so willingly, serving willingly, but not for money. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many things. <clears throat> so at this point, you consider there is a quality of character that these men must have. And what we see here is what they must avoid. If they are above reproach, they are not arrogant men. They are not quick-tempered. They are not quarrelsome, looking for fights. They're not drunken men. They're not given to violence. They're not greedy. You might think, that seems a little too easy. I, I, I think I can stay away from those things. Well, consider the heart. Consider the heart from where these things come. But notice there's also one more thing to be avoided by would-be elders. It's an interesting verse that we find in 1 Timothy 3, verse 6. Verse 6. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Paul says that Timothy must resist the temptation to appoint a new believer as an elder. The word is neophyte. He can't be a neophyte. He can't be a, a newbie. At first, you might wonder, how is that a temptation? Why would you want to do that anyway? Why would you want to get this new believer and throw him right onto the leadership team, the elder board? But it might not take long to picture a scenario where you could do that, or it may be tempting. 
You're feeling short on leadership. There's a lot to do. And so Timothy could have been tempted to just grab the nearest man to join the leadership team. We need more people. You come help. I just got saved. I don't care. We need you. And you yank him onto the leadership team. Or you see the physical perks someone might bring to the table if they're brought on as a leader. Well, this guy is, I know I'm not supposed to know this, but he's one of our, our biggest financial donors. He gives the most. He's got a lot of money. He's wealthy. Maybe he should be a part of this. We don't want to make him mad. We want him supporting. We want to keep him here. Or that guy, wow, he says one thing and he gets a lot of influence. He gets people moving. Bring him on. He just got saved. It doesn't matter. Just bring him on. He'll bring a whole host with him. It'll be great. People get like this with celebrities too, don't they? Oh, a certain celebrity made a profession of faith. That's awesome. And you want to platform the heck out of them. And what happens? Time will tell. Time will really tell. But it needs to be maturity. So Paul prohibits this. He prohibits new believers from such a role as elder. Otherwise, there's going to be temptation for arrogance and conceit, and it's not going to end well. So Paul calls the course plainly as a course that will lead to the, the same arrogant condemnation of the devil. So we pray. We pray that we resist the urge to shortcut the sanctification process in someone's life in order to appoint an elder at MCC. That we wouldn't fall victim to that, but instead take this seriously. Again, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And that takes time. We move on and we see our fourth point here, the assumed character of an elder. We've seen in more detail what he must not be. Now we see more clearly what he must be, what above reproach will look like. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. Titus 1, 8, very similarly, hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Let's start with hospitable as we find in Titus 1, 8. It's, it's literally the, the word lover of strangers, a lover of strangers. That is what an elder is to be. As we think of elsewhere in, in places like 1 Peter 4, 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's for all of us. We all must do that. Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So we see that within the body of Christ, but we also see it with strangers as well. Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby, some have entertained angels unawares. A commentator writes, Given the dangers of travel in the empire and their economic uncertainties that faced by many believers, the early Christian mission and churches depended upon those who'd be opening their homes and sharing their goods. He goes on to say, Overseers must be the type of people who will gladly welcome people into their homes. What else? A lover of good. A phrase found only here in the New Testament but not a foreign concept, as the fruit of the Spirit has this embedded in it, goodness and faithfulness. Ephesians 5, 9, the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And there's this connection to good works all throughout the book of Titus that shows that this must be a quality of the church, how much more so of the elders. Overseers must be models of good works and fruitful living. Self-control. Self-control has a wide range of meanings here. The word group covers a range in describing behavior that, depending on the context, includes prudence, sobriety, and modesty, even. But it's major for the rest of this letter in Titus. Older men are to be self-controlled. Younger men are to be self-controlled. And they are to teach these things to those. The gospel is to train us to live self-controlled lives. Peter says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore we must be self-controlled. Paul tells Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. What's the significance? A commentator writes, whatever the theological, ethical, or interpersonal issue, whether public or private, the advisability for a church leader being steady and dependable, not at the mercy of pressures external to himself, is self-evident. To have self-control no matter the circumstances. To be in any situation and to have things go upside down and to be able to still remain self-controlled. Upright. A distinction between righteous and, and upright. Paul is writing here not about the fact that a person is declared righteous through Christ, but about righteous living. Just a righteous lifestyle. The NASB says just, that they are just. And interactions between church leaders and other people must be described as that. They have just and righteous interactions among those in the church. There's no room for elders to be showing partiality and favoritism. 
That must not exist. They must be righteous, just, and fair in their interactions with others. And that must be clear. They must be holy. They must be holy as we know for Christians, this is a call for all of us, that we are to be holy in all that we do, as God himself is holy. Perhaps holy is referring to one and how we interact before God, while just and upright is referring to how we interact with one another. One commentator says, holiness is a condition of inward purity that then has outward results. There's more though. Elders must be disciplined. Similar to the term for self-control, self-control deals more with keeping oneself from outward temptations. Discipline deals with one's own desires and appetites and thoughts. Discipline in those things. And how can one recognize a disciplined man? It will show itself in time in an external display. As Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7, train or discipline yourself for godliness. They are disciplined for godliness. In Paul's writing to Timothy, he adds a couple other character qualities for elders to assume, that they're sober-minded. And this could be temperate in reference to sobriety and wine, but Paul's probably more so referring to mental sobriety since he says, not a drunkard in verse 3. So here he probably has a figurative meaning in mind. That an elder should regard his calling and duties with sobriety rather than flippancy. It's a balance. They are balanced in their judgment as well as their mental and emotional state. Lastly, in 1 Timothy 3, we also see the word respectable. This unique word displays the external result of internal self-control. From a self-controlled person will come proper and fitting behavior. From speech to dress to time spent this person will be respectable. One commentator writes, with respect to an overseer, the sense is having characteristics or qualities that evoke admiration or delight so that a person is actually held in high regard. Another commentator says, an elder cannot expect people to follow him if he's not respectable. We must pray for MCC. Pray that we will recognize men of such character. These character qualities will prevent sin from destroying the church. And these character qualities will guide us through whatever God has in the future as a church. We also got to do a self-evaluation, each of us this morning. Am I above reproach? Are these qualities true of my own life? You strive to follow Christ. You strive to be mature and grow in Christ-likeness. This is for you. Don't tune out at these things. Let these things be brought upon your own heart and your own life. Let them have an impact. Am I hospitable? Am I known for doing good, a lover of good, self-controlled, my upright and holy, my disciplined person, my sober-minded in all that I do, am I respectable? How will you personally give attention to even growing yourself in these areas? So this morning we've been looking at this whole entire topic, the character of elders, that they must be above reproach. That's going to be affirmed clearly in the home, through marriage and parenting, and in the world. It's going to be seen in what they avoid. They're avoiding drunkenness, violence, quarrels, greed, arrogance, and the fact that they're not a recent convert. And it's going to be seen in what they do and how they are sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, they're hospitable, they're full of good deeds, upright, holy, disciplined. This is a character we should all aspire toward in the Christian life. But why is this so important? Why does God give a lot of attention to the character of his leaders in the church? I mean, there's a lot of reasons we could give, but why? Why? We've got to ask that question, why? Why does God give this much attention to them? Because when you think of elders, like you said, you might be thinking in your mind, I don't think there's too many places I can go. Although you see it mentioned several times, it might be a verse here, a verse there. But when you think of the main passages, these are it. Where you have qualifications listed. God caring deeply about the character of his leadership. Why? Because the model and example of the leaders is what the church is prone to follow. Every time. The model and the example of the leaders of any organization is what people will follow. This is important to God. He doesn't want people that the world goes ooh and ah at. He wants people that love him from the heart and show it as men of character. That will then be the example. And that's what the people will follow. If the people pick different leaders, if the, if the church assembles a completely different dynamic for the leadership team, then the church will definitely be fast on that track to whatever kind of quality leaders they just put into place. 
The model in the example is what the church will follow. A writer says it this way, since all God's people are called to live holy and blameless lives, and since the world casts a critical eye at the Christian community, and since Christian leaders lead primarily by their example, an irreproachable life is indispensable to the Christian leader. This is what it has to be. This is what it has to be. The world is watching. We're called to holiness, and we must go there together as a church. So we need men. We need leaders that are committed to that very thing, that are exemplifying it already, above reproach. Let's pray for God to do that. Heavenly Father, we take this topic now before you, one that you care deeply about by way of this, the amount and quantity of what we find in your word, as well as the strength by which it is stated, that overseers, that elders must be above reproach. This is not optional. And so we want that to settle in, in our hearts and our minds, that you would protect us from any type of creative wisdom that we want to bring to the scene or the picture, and instead we would let the simplicity of what your word says drive us, God. That the proper elders, the leaders that you want in place would be put in place because of character. And that that character would shine like a light, and that MCC would follow, and we would be on that path of holiness and righteousness. Like your son, modeling the truth for this world as well. Help us, God. Protect us from from sinful errors and and hypocrisy and the other things that will certainly take take the ship down, God, and sink what you have already begun. God, we ask that you would protect us from that. Let holiness and let righteousness be what is on display and be our desire and be what we're longing for. We pray this in your name. Amen.